Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We are in the book of Exodus, also known as uh, Shemot, names or character. And we see in this book how Yahweh is revealing himself to his people, how he's drawing his people to himself, how he's fulfilling his promises. And, and that's who he is. That's not just some things that he does. This is a character of our God. This is a character of Yahweh himself. And uh, the, the thing is, Israel's having a hard time seeing what Yahweh is about to do in their lives because they're looking at their current circumstances and and not seeing, well, how's he going to do this? Yeah, I hear what you're saying, Moses, but how, how is all this stuff going to happen that you're saying? So we can learn a lot here. Um, the question is, are we going to have faith in Yahweh? Are we going to follow him? Are we going to pursue him and listen to him and be obedient to what he is saying? Or are we going to continue to just look around in the world and the ways of the world and just the things that we can see physically and say, this is it. It's not going to get any better than this. So we've got a few choices to make in here. Okay. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's really interesting because this portion of scripture about era and I appeared speaking of Yahweh, when he says he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he's about to appear uh, to the people of Israel. He's about to show up to the people of Israel on their behalf. We'll cover that a little more in a minute, but uh, here Yahweh is saying, I appeared to them, and this is a response, actually, from the closing of last week's Parsha, where uh, uh, this is actually a complaint, and, and what we see here in this Parsha opening up is Yahweh responding to the complaint of the people of Israel. Now, we know that he, he said in the beginning here, and when we when we first opened this book, that God said, "I've heard their cries. I've heard them crying out. I've, they're they're oppressed. I heard their crying out." But that's not exactly what's happening here. Okay, they he heard their crying out. Yahweh sent Moshe. He said, I, "I've come. I'm going to deliver you." And uh, and the people were like, "That's great. How come it hasn't happened yet?" Right. <laughs> so we start to see how this is unfolding before us. Okay. So uh, what was the complaint really? And, and what was really happening here? Well, let's, let's go back at the closing of last week's Parsha and take a look at it. Okay. So let's back up to Exodus five and we're looking into verses 15 to 23 to really help set us up. So verse 15. So the foreman of the people of Israel came and they cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, and yet they say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle, that is why you say, let us go sacrifice to Yahweh. So go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. Verse 19. So the foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, uh, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. So they met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to him, Yahweh, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Uh, you see what's going on here? Moses and Aaron were waiting outside as the foreman of the people went in to talk to Pharaoh. And uh, so they came out like, well, how did it go? Like, <laughs> Moses, you're killing us. And, 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 and these things, I mean, you said Yahweh was going to deliver us. It's getting worse. What's going on? You know, and, and they're, they're putting more work on us now. Now they're not giving us the supplies to do what we need to do. Now we got to go get the supplies and do it. And, uh, and so there's, and things are getting worse. Okay. Uh, Yahweh says, I'm going to deliver you. And people are like, great, this is awesome. Wait a minute. Why is it getting worse? Right? So what happens with Moses? I mean, this is why the people were like, Moses, God is going to judge for what you've done to us. I mean, this is concerning to the people and Moses as well, because Moses doesn't see what's happening here either, right? So uh, verse 22, so then Moses turned to Yahweh and says, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to all this people and have not delivered your people at all. And then we see uh, Yahweh telling him, now you're going to see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. So it's kind of like the people had to get in a certain place in their life to see what God is about to do on their behalf. It's like, yeah, we, we, we hear that God is going to deliver us, but yeah. I mean, were they really believing it? What was really going on here? Is it just words? What's happening, right? And uh, what we start to see is, we don't see it right here, but we'll, I'll show you here in a minute, but there was a response required on the people of Israel. At the very least, the response would have been to hear what Moses was saying and follow him. Okay, he says, we're going to come out and the people should, like, great, 
how? Let's do it. We're, we're with you, right? So what exactly is going on here? And uh, as normal, you know, there, there's always a little more than meets the eye. There's always a little more than what we see that's going on. We can always dig a little deeper, right? So what's going on here? Well, this is the response that Yahweh gives to Moshe. Does he say, oh, tell the people of Israel, just stop whining? No, 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 no. He says, now you're about to see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. And, and, and he says, I came to your fathers as, as El Shaddai. I came to them and I was in their life, what they needed at that time. And he's telling them, Look and see what I'm about to do in your life right here, right now. Not just in your life, but in Pharaoh and the Egyptians and all this around too, right? So what's going on? Let's take a look at it. So Exodus 6, 2 says, God spoke to Moses and he says, I am Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan and the land which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. We'll come back to that a little later, but he says, uh, you see this. He says, uh, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, uh, I've remembered covenant. Covenant with who? Aha, uh -huh. covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, uh, again, we'll come back to this in a minute. But here he says, I am Yahweh. I appeared as El Shaddai here, but by my name, Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, I didn't make myself known to them. He says, the things I'm about to do now are things that your forefathers didn't experience, but I'm doing it because I made covenant and I made promises with your forefathers. Okay, so again, we're talking about Yahweh fulfilling and keeping covenant and issues relating to covenant, right? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give you to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am Yahweh. So in this in these verses six through eight, we see multiple expressions of, of independent acts that are being done together as redemption. Okay, so he always says, I am redeeming you. I will redeem you. He says, I will bring you out. Okay, I will bring you out. You will, you will not be anywhere where you are here now. I will bring you out. You will no longer serve Mitzrayim, but you will serve me. Those that have oppressed you, you don't have to worry about. I, you are mine. I'm, gonna, I'm going to bring you to myself. I'm going to show you this. Okay, and we see this in multiple expressions that are given here. And just go through and, and read verses six or eight. And you can see independent things where he says, I will do this for you. I will do that for you. So we see each one of these things is independent in and of themselves, but all together, Yahweh is saying, I am redeeming you. This is why when Israel came out of Mitzrayim, this was an act of redemption. And that's why we say they, they were redeemed. And, and as you go through and read the book of Exodus, you can see more than one place this is what's going on. But uh, he says, I've redeemed you. Then he took them through the water, which is a mikvah, which is a baptism, right? And then he brought them to the mountain, to himself, to reveal himself to them by his spirit and his word to equip them to go into the promise that he said was theirs. So again, this is the same process that he takes us through in our lives. We are redeemed, we're, we're mikvah, baptized, and uh, then we get into the word to learn what his word says, to learn his heart, to learn how to walk in his ways and walk into the promise that he is telling us, okay? So all of this is what's going on here. The people had to get to their place of crying out, but we also see something else in here too, uh, which we'll show you in just a minute. We'll also see something else in here too that's required for redemption, and that is repentance. See, God is not going to redeem you out of your own will. You know, if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But yet he says he will redeem you as an act of covenant. See that? You have to be willing to come in and be a part of and take place in this covenant. And that means you uphold the covenant. You learn to walk according to the covenant. Okay, so how does all this fall into play and where is this scene? Well, let's keep going. Next verse, verse nine. So Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Interesting there. It says they did not listen to Moshe. It's Velo Shem'u 
And again, Shavu, that's Shema El Moshe. They did not Shema to Moses. Interesting. I mean, Moses is saying, uh, so here, the God has sent me, you're going to be redeemed, you're going to be brought out, and you're going to have your, bring you to the land that's been promised to your forefathers. They didn't believe him. See, again, is it important to believe what Moses says? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, not because it's Moses, but it's because he is who Yahweh had chose to be a deliverer for the people of Israel and to help bring them to himself and to reveal his word to them, his covenants, his promises, all of these things. Okay. Uh, remember at the burning bush, Yahweh told Moshe, uh, the sign that I have sent you is you're going to come back to this mountain and the people are going to worship me. Okay. It's interesting because he said, the sign that I have sent you is going to happen after you've done it. So there, there was a degree of faith that was needed to be required there, right? Just as in our lives, there's a degree of faith that needs to be required there. And we need to approach the word as it is for us. We need to pay attention to what it says, not just read the, the scriptures as a storybook. We need to read it as words that are meant to uh, be instruction for us, words that are supposed to be life to us and supposed to change us, things that are supposed to be within us to help us live more like what Yahweh is desiring for us to live. Again, if we understand that the word of Yahweh that was given to us when he gave the Torah was to be an expression of his heart to learn to walk in his ways, to be more like him, then we're, then we're learning that step by step. So the, the problem is, if we can discount Moses, which we see Israel doing this time again in the desert, right? If we can discount Moses, and it's not just Moses, but if we can discredit Moses, then in our minds, we don't have to listen to him. Right? If we can say, no, nope, he's human, he made a mistake, see, I saw it with my own eyes, therefore every single thing he has said is false. See, it, it, it's, that's not the way it is, is it? See, so uh, yeah, Moses is a man. Did Moses make mistakes? Yes, absolutely. Did Moses mess up? Yes, absolutely. But yet it did not change the word that Yahweh had given through Moses. Okay, so we've got some things to learn here. Uh, one, are we going to listen to the words that Moses says? Because are they important? Well, Yeshua says they're important, right? In John 5, 46, he says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Yeshua is saying, if you believe Moses, then you'll believe me because he spoke of me. But if you're not going to believe Moses, how can you believe what I say? See that? Yeshua is saying, the things that I'm telling you, you've heard from Moses. So again, do we believe Moses? Uh, and also we say, well, no, we don't need to believe Moses because we believe Yeshua, right? Well, it works the other way as well. If we believe Yeshua, we need to believe what Moses said. Because these things do not contradict. They work together, right? So again, we need to learn to pay attention and believe what Moses says. But is it just belief? Is it just to listen to what Moses said? Notice it says, they, but they did not listen to Moses. They, uh, okay, is listening really the important thing here? Now, the word that was used there is Shema, which is the word used there for listening, but it's not like a, a Azinu, like give ear, listen up, right? Uh, what's the difference? Well, one is just literally just, just paying attention, like broadening out the ear, paying attention so that you can hear the words. And the other is an act of receiving the words intent on obedience. That's Shema. To hear and to do. Shema is also used with obey. So again, uh, they did not listen to Moses. It says they did not Shema Moses. So they did not believe Moses. They didn't listen to Moses. They did not obey Moses. What were they supposed to obey? Uh, I don't see, in, at the first reading through this, I don't see anything in there that uh, the people were supposed to obey regarding Moses. I, even, I mean, up, up to this point, Moses came, he said that Yahweh sent me, he said, uh, I'm, I'm going to, Yahweh says he's going to deliver you, right? Um, and so the people were like, that's great. So where in that do we see a command? Where in that do we see something the people were supposed to do that Moses told them that they're responding See what I mean? It's, it's, it's a little, hmm, it, it, there's a question there. Well, there's an answer. And uh, just like many other places in the scripture, like when you're reading through the Gospels, right, uh, you'll see sometimes the same story given in the different Gospels. It's more than one telling of the same thing. 
And I believe we have those reasons because there's different perspectives. It's not like it's a completely different thing or it's false or one's right, one's wrong. It's just that there's a different perspective of the same events, of the same things that were happening. So we see that scripture often gives witness to itself as far as what's going on and what's happening. So we might find something in one place, but we'll find something else in the other place that helps expand what's being of what we understand of what's happening there. Okay. So uh, we're told that Moses went and, and, and Yahweh had heard them and Moses was going to lead them out. So what was the command? Uh, could it possibly be that the command was to believe, to listen, to follow? How about to prepare your heart to do what I'm about to ask you to do? In other words, prepare your heart to make a decision to, I'm going to say, follow me. See that? Uh, you need to prepare your heart to make the decision to follow Yahweh, to come out of Egypt when he says come out, to do what he is telling you to do before you do come out, to instruct you in his ways. Uh, like Passover, right? There were some things that they had to do in regarding to that. But up to this point, that, that hasn't been given yet, right? So what's, what's going on? What's happening? Uh, to find the answer to this, let's look forward into Ezekiel. Back, in, back into the prophets, right? Speaking of uh, things that were given uh, to Israel in Egypt, do you think the prophets would have said anything about it? Sure, sure. Um, do you think Yahweh is revealing things to the prophets? Absolutely. Do you think there's things that the prophets knew that we don't? Absolutely, <laughs> right? Let's go, let's take a look at it. Exodus, or sorry, Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20, verse 5. So it says, say to them, thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel, I swore to the offspring, to the house of Jacob, making myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I swore to them, saying, I am Yahweh your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most glorious of all lands. Look at verse 7. And I said to them, so you look at this, and I said to them, when? On this day, when he says, I'm bringing you out, right? Cast away the detestable things your eyes feast on, every one of you, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Stop there for a second. When did he say this in the story? When Moses first went to them, when did he say this? Now understand, uh, Moses went to the elders first, and he spoke to them. Then they went to Israel. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that we do not have every word of these conversations. <laughs> okay? So is it is it possible that Moses went and says, Yahweh's heard your Christ is going to deliver you. You guys need to repent for the things you've done here in Egypt because you've made yourself, even though you've been enslaved, you've made yourself like the cultures of Egypt. You've picked up idolatry. Get rid of your idols. I am Yahweh your God. Notice the context of this, how he says, get rid of these things. Get rid of the detestable things. Repent is what he's telling them to do. Repent. I am Yahweh your God. Not these idols. I am your God. See that? So this is what he's, this is what's going on here. So first off, he says, I've heard your cries. You really want to be delivered? You really want things to change? You're covenant, you were in covenant with me, but you've forgotten that. You've picked up idolatry. Repent, and I'm going to lead you out. Look at verse 8. But they rebelled against me, and they were not willing to listen to me. See that? Again, see that phrase? Velo avu lishmoa elai. So again, the word shema, they did not shema me. None of them cast away their detestable things their eyes feasted on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I would pour out my wrath upon them and spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they lived, and in whose sight I made myself known to them in bringing them out of the land of Egypt. See that? Yahweh promised that he was going to bring them out. So he was going to bring them out, even though many of them at this point were still unrepentant. But we haven't gotten into the plagues yet, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, so again, Yahweh is telling them, prepare your hearts to follow me. Get ready for what is about to happen. Life is going to get tough here. You're going to start to have some of these plagues. You're going to see some things going on there. It's, uh, it's not going to be what you think, but I want you to trust me. I want you to repent. I want you to get rid of these idols, get rid of the ways of Egypt and follow me. But the people didn't listen, right? Look at verse 10. 
So I led them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and made known to them my rules by which if a person does them, he shall live. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies them. So again, he says, I want you to hear my voice. If you go on to read in Ezekiel, you'll find out. But they didn't. They rebelled and, and they didn't. Okay. Uh, we see through the history of Israel, they, they came to Yahweh and then they rebelled. Or they came to him and they didn't listen to him. Then they were exiled. And then they came back and constantly. But again, guys, this is don't try to judge them too harshly because this is some things that we see in our lives as well, right? Uh, let's come to him and let's learn to hear his voice, which is why he said when he brought them out of Egypt, he brought them to the mountain. He says, if you will hear my voice, the word Shema means to be obedient. Much like Yeshua, when he says, uh, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. Notice it's not just hearing his voice. It's hearing his voice being obedient. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Again, not just hearing, but hearing and receiving and acting upon it. That's what was said at the mountain in Exodus 19, where he says, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, that word obey my voice, it means to hear me, hear my voice, obey my voice, be obedient. Keep my covenant. How do you how do you obey his voice? Keep his covenant. And then you shall be my treasured possession among all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. So again, Moses gave them these words for life, gave them words of deliverance. He told them what they really wanted to hear. God is going to deliver you. He's heard your cries. He's going to bring you out into the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're like, yeah. But you got to repent. Wait, no, what? That wasn't part of the deal. Actually, it was part of the deal. It's just the people who walked away from it and not wanting to hear that part, <laughs> right? So what happens next? Okay, it says they did not listen to Moses. Why? Because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. This says something for our lives. This says something for us too. It says they didn't listen because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Um, they were broken, uh, they were oppressed. They were in, in Mitzrayim and, and they were in slavery and uh, they were being beaten. And, they, and now their workload is increasing. And now they say, we want to serve Yahweh. And Pharaoh saying, oh, you're just not busy enough. You got too much time on your hands. You need to be busier. Uh, and isn't that the same thing the adversary tries to do in our lives today? Uh, nope. You're just, you're, you want to serve Yahweh? Nah, see, you're just not busy enough. Let's make you busier. See, if we can get you busier, 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 you're not going to have the time to serve Yahweh because you're going to see the circumstances right in front of you and something else is always going to take a priority in your life that belongs to Yahweh. And uh, so this temptation is to get you so busy that you forget about Yahweh. You forget about his heart. You forget about the things that he wants for you to do because we're so busy doing our own things, right? So again, it's difficult to see outside of our current circumstances. So in these times, do we prepare our hearts to receive the word of Yahweh and faith? Will we follow him? Will we do what he is uh, asking for us to do? Or are we so caught up in our own world that we forget about Yahweh and his kingdom, right? Much like when the scripture says the sower sows the seed. And uh, one of these things that tries to steal out the seed is, uh, is the cares of this cares of this world. Look in, in Mark 14 or Mark four verses 14 to 20. The emphasis for this case is verses 18 and 19, where it says, uh, these are those, these are those that are being sown into the thorns, those hearing the word and the cares of this age and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts about the other things entering in, they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So again, we have the word of Yahweh. Moses gave them the word of Yahweh. This is directly what he heard. These are the words that Yahweh said. And the people did not want to hear them because they were so entangled in what was going on in their life right now. See that? And then Pharaoh says, oh, no, you're just not busy enough. Let's make you busier. Right? Why do you think Shabbat is such, a, such an important thing? Why do you think Shabbat is such a big deal? Because in the very beginning of everything, you know, man was supposed to watch over the garden 
keep it and guard it, protect it. Right. And then after, after the fall, right after, after the sin entered in, uh, he was kicked out of the garden. And then he says, by the sweat of your brow, by the work of your hands you're the, and the thorns, you're going to get the, the, the ground to produce for you. Um, that which was going to be a pleasure and a delight and, and, and just watching over and guarding, having authority over doing this has now become your work going to work hard for it. So how much more important is Shabbat at that point to stop from the curse, if you will, that sin had brought in and it'd have a return back to that, the beginning when everything was created, the original order of everything and having that relationship and communion with Yahweh and that which he created his people see that. So it's important to do that. So where is our pursuit? Where are our desires and where are the things that we're, that we're being involved in, right? Are we willing to uh, stop and listen to what Yahweh is telling us today? Uh, Again, we see this in second Thessalonians two, nine through 12, where it says the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because why? They refuse to love the truth and be saved or and be delivered. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Doesn't this kind of allude to what was going on in Egypt? When we go back and we read in Ezekiel, we find out that uh, the Moses came and, and told the people, this is what's going on. Yahweh is going, come, it's deliver you. This is an awesome thing for us. But the people didn't repent when they heard the words. They were told to get rid of the idols. They were told to get rid of the Egypt that crept into them. And um, nope, they didn't do it. They were unrepentant. Hmm. You wonder why there was so much problem in the wilderness? Because the people's hearts were not set to hear Yahweh completely. They said they were, they followed him out, but were they really there? Okay. Uh, Why do we have a lot of the problems? Well, even Pharaoh himself, right? Why all the, so many plagues, why not just the declaration? And Pharaoh says, okay, great. Okay. Your God says, let him go. I'm letting him go. No, it was the hardness of his heart. Right. Romans two, five says, because of the hardness of your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of righteous judgment of God. So again, when the word comes to us says, I want you are, you are my people. I want to have this relationship with you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to bring you out of the things that oppress you. We're like, that's great. He says, but I want you to repent for being there and allowing the things in there that crept in that got you in this situation. They're like, eh, no, no, I don't want to do that. See, no, see, let's not be like that. Let's, uh, let's learn to listen to his voice and follow him and, and bring him out and bring us out. Right. Um, you may have heard the phrase, the truth will set you free. That's not the whole phrase. Okay. And because if we say the truth, well, what is the truth? Uh, if you ask people what truth is, it's, it, you'll find there's many different definitions of what people think truth is, but there is only one tr- absolute truth that is Yahweh and his word. They are one. Okay. Again, and going back to the scripture, the truth will set you free. And John 8, 31 and 32 It says, Yeshua says to the Judeans who had trusted him, if you abide in my word, see that first off, abide in my word. How do we abide in his word? That means we have to be his people. First off to abide in his word. That means we live in his word and his word lives in us. Okay. So uh, how do we get there? That's repentance. That's the place of covenant. That's already relationship, but that's living it day by day by day, having it in us. So if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we have to abide in the word to be his disciple. Disciple means student. So how long are we, how long do we study? It's a continual thing. So we abide in the word, we're studying in the word, we're learning to be like him. Then he says, you will know the truth. Why? Because he reveals himself and his life and truth in, in all that. And then the truth will set you free. So again, it's not just the truth will set you free. You have to understand what truth is. 
Okay, much like righteousness and justice, how can you have righteousness and justice if you have a perverted idea of what that is? You have to have the absolute. Okay, so back to uh, Exodus, Exodus 6, 5. It says, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians have sold as slaves or hold as slaves, and I have what? Remembered my covenant. So see that? So Yahweh is saying, and it doesn't mean he forgot his covenant. When the scripture says, I have remembered, what it means is I will act on behalf of it. It says that God remembered. It doesn't mean that he forgot. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, I guess I should do something about these guys, right? No, he says that now is the time for me to act on behalf of the covenant. Remember means to acknowledge and act upon. Okay, we are doing something because of it. So because of what? Because of covenant. Covenant with whom? Covenant with Abraham. Uh, We go back to Genesis 12. It says, now Yahweh says to Avram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse. And in you, all the families who there shall be blessed. That's part of that, right? Go to verse 13. And uh, Yahweh says to Avram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on that nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Go to Genesis 17, verse 7. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So again, um, Yahweh is saying from Avram, again, his name changed to Avraham, right? He says, I, I am going to do this for you. Your descendants are going to go to this land. They're going to be there. I'm going to bring them out. I'm going to bring them back to this land. And so when Yahweh came to Israel in Mitzrayim, he says, I am now acting upon the covenant that I established with Avraham. So the people of Israel were partakers of this covenant because it was extended from all their generations. They had to come to a place to accept it for themselves and to act upon it for themselves, but they were already involved in that. Okay, look, in Exodus 3, 16 and 17, it says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, speaking to Moshe, right? Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done to, done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. See that? So again, he's, when he first went to them, he says that God has heard you and he's going to bring you out as he told your fathers. Again, there's that connection in there, right? And then he says, what? Exodus 6, 8, I will bring you into a land that I swore to give to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. But what is our, our part in this? Repent and follow him. Okay. We have a responsibility to follow Yah. And if not, we will not be very long in the promises if we get there at all. Right. Um, look, look again to something that Yahweh was giving a promise in the wilderness. That again, ties into all this. Look, Leviticus 26, 40 says, but if they confess their iniquity, that's again, that's, we're talking about repentance, Right. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and their treachery that they committed against me, and also in walking contrary to me, so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity. Again, we're talking about repentance, right? What does it say? And I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Isaac. And I will remember my covenant with Avraham and I will remember the land. This is really cool because he says, if you repent, I will remember my covenant. These were not separate covenants that he made here. These were all one covenant uh, that he, he said, Abraham, then, then it was extended to because it included 
Isaac, and same thing, included Jacob, included Israel and his sons regarding the promise and the land. I mean, all this together, but interesting how it's phrased here, though. Because normally when we hear about this, we hear like God himself. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So when we talk about this, we always say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? But here it's backwards. It's backwards. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the descendants of Jacob, talking to Israel. So he starts with where they're at, but then he kind of leads them backwards. Look at this. I remember my covenant with Jacob, with Isaac, with Abraham, and the land. The imagery he's going here is a restoration, taking you from where you're at and bringing you back to a restoration to the place of the garden itself, back to a restoration of the land itself, to the beginning of the creating. And Yahweh says, I will dwell with you. I will be your God. You will be my people in this relationship coming in together. Again, what is redemption about? It's about having relationship with the Most High, the one who has created you, desires to be with you. Wow, that's, that's a lot in here, guys, and there's much more we can cover, but that's all we've got the time for today. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it has encouraged you, and I hope it has challenged you as well. Uh, and if it has, then I ask that you please share them. Please share these teachings on whatever social outlet you, you watch on or you listen on, whatever it is. Uh, please share the, share them and help get the word out there. And our, our goal is to bring life to all who hear it or watch, and you are a big part of that. So please hear, like, listen watch, share, all of that. And if this has been a blessing to you as well, please consider making a donation to help us uh, keep these things going. It, it does have a, a cost involved in uh, making these things up and running and equipment and just keeping things going and running in general, right? And uh, certain platforms do cost us. So uh, if this has been a blessing to you, then please consider making a donation to help us keep this moving along, all right? So guys, uh, that is it. That's all we got for you today. So until next time, may you be blessed and shalom.